This is a, another episode of Seeds of Greatness. I have here Steve. Steve, his, his YouTube is Steve in the Mix. And I just have a long list of questions just for him to help the list all the listeners advance their careers. I got my coffee. I'm ready. <laughs> Where are How you, you doing, from? man? Good, good. I'm good. I'm good. I am from Vancouver, Canada. So okay. I am not far away from the studios that were really big in the 80s, all the all the Bon Jovi records and Motley Crue records and anything in the 80s that was big hair. <laughs> That go. happened here. I don't have as much hair as 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 those guys, but you know, I'm doing my best to look cool. Well, I was born in the in the late '80s, so. <laughs> okay, and you're in Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Are you are you in Detroit? Um, like near Flint. Mm. Yeah, but I'm all, I'm all over the place. Um, I was in California, uh, Maryland, Florida. So you're getting, you're getting um, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm all over all over the place. Um, and right before this, I was in Charlotte, so North Carolina. That's what got me back into music. Actually, I went into a guitar center and um, I had hit on the MPCX, mm. like for the sounds. And I was like, whoa, this you know, these sounds are crazy. I was like, uh, because I had stopped after a while. I, I used to make music on from FL Studio during the MySpace time, yeah. and I didn't know about like tempo and stuff. So a lot of it was pretty much just stuck at the, the default and it was turning and I, I didn't know about plugins or any of that stuff. So it was just turning into like, just a lot of like techno or something. Uh, <laughs> so, I was, so, and I was just using the laptop. So I didn't know about, you know, how good audio could be. And um, when I went into Guitar Center and tried it, I was like, man, this, you know, these sounds are good and like crisp and everything. And so. Um, they had, you know, hooked up to some good speakers too. So that's what got me back into it. Cause I was just using like a laptop a long time ago and I kind of quit just because like, like a lot of the different reasons, like the sounds and, you know, the sound wasn't that good and all that kind of stuff. Um, just coming from a laptop, but you know, now I'm learning about all that stuff and how to get quality audio and all that stuff. That's why I like, people I love like their your... NPCs, man. Sorry to interrupt you. I know you're good. Yeah. That's why I liked your stuff. Cause I, you know, um, you're teach and you're teaching a lot of the audio, how to get your audio better. So I, you know, I see that. Yeah, I mean, I, I have been a producer for for twenty years, and uh, and I work with a lot of young people, and and so when they're with me, of course, we're in a studio or in my project studio, and they have a lot of questions, and so I kind of felt like when I started my YouTube, you know what, man, I I would kind of like to help some people that don't have access to someone with a little bit more experience. And a lot of these, these things are, you don't have to be an audio engineer, you don't have to be super technical, but if if nobody shows you, how do you know? Because all the cool stuff I know, mm -hmm. I didn't invent, somebody showed me. And that's, that's what I'm telling people now, like it's important to find a mentor, you know, because some, oh, somebody, somebody that knows that's been there or could uh, show you new stuff or, you know, um, that's that's why I wanted to do this to like anybody listening, they could like learn a whole bunch of stuff like like how do I get my song on the radio by listening to somebody that's done it or you know what what do I need to start if I'm if I don't have any equipment and all that kind of stuff, you know, just to cut the learning curve. You know, I think mentorship is important. I think people focus a, a lot on e either it's scary to reach out to people or they feel like being self taught is good and and Trust me, you're going to spend a lot of time learning on your own. But if, but like you say, if you can shorten the learning curve, hey, I, I still study with people now, and I've been doing this for a minute, and it's valuable. And, and I'll tell you, especially during COVID, depending on what you're doing, I find most people are pretty receptive. You know, like if you reach out to somebody, maybe they don't have a lot of time, but mm -hmm. I, I got a, I got a very good strategy from a guy named uh, Michael Lawrence who works for. Uh, a company called smart which does the measurement software that we use when we're measuring like speakers in, in spaces and his strategy is reach out to somebody but with a specific question because you give them the opportunity to answer you instead of like this long-winded writing an essay kind of thing like hey you're you know give the reason i'm reaching out to you is i think this is really cool what you do 
how do you do this? Or what do you think about this? And give them the opportunity to give you a two sentence answer. Uh -huh. Kind of can get the ball rolling, you know? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Um, so just just for anybody new to you, where can the people find you at on social media? Uh, my my Instagram is Steve underscore in underscore the underscore mix, man. Why did I think about that? <laughs> <You're good. laughs> and and my YouTube is Steve in the mix. And my YouTube is is mostly about uh, non-technical how do I record stuff better. Mm -hmm. And my Instagram, I just talk about anything. And, and sometimes what I do is when I'm working on mixes, I just show you what I'm doing. And I don't explain a lot, but for, for other people who are just kind of wondering, like, what does my process look like? It's kind of more, I mean, you know, Instagram videos are not long, yeah, but it, it, it might shed some light into I'm, I'm doing this and I'm using, I'm using this on an 808 or something like that. Yeah. That's what I like about YouTube. It's, it, it gives you a, better insight into people's like processes or, or just their lives in general, just to learn, you know, learn more about the person in general. So um, like, I liked, uh, just recently I watched your video about going, you going to the Grammys. How was that? Oh man. We, well, I guess we won't be going this year, but uh, right? <laughs> I, I've gone, I've gone to the Grammys uh, for, for a long time. And I'm a member of NARIS, which is the North American Recording Academy. And uh, it's it's fun to go to the show, and it like it really is. And I usually take someone with me who hasn't been before. Like I I've taken my daughters the last couple of years, and so so that's exciting. But what it really is, it's it's a great opportunity for me to try and connect with people that I've worked with previously. You know, a lot of this business is just being is just networking, but. But what I tell people is network to make friends. Don't network to take advantage of, oh, if I know this person, this opportunity will come my way. I don't go into it like that at all. Like, wow, I haven't seen Jack or I haven't seen Jamie or I haven't seen Jolene or whatever in a year. I'm going to LA and my whole focus is, can we go have lunch? Can we go get a coffee? Can we, can we hang out? And I just try and hang out with as many people as I can and it's not like, hey, if you got any work you could throw my way, it's never that. It's like, what are you doing? Play me what you're up to. And and people just, people want to share what they're doing. And 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 uh, more often than not, somebody calls me like two or three weeks later. I'm doing a bunch of mixes right now for somebody that I hung out with in LA that I hadn't hung out with for a while, but I've known for a long time. And all of a sudden it's like, oh man, you could be doing mixes for me. What am I thinking? But without that little reminder, mm -hmm. wouldn't happen. Yeah, that's what I tell people. Networking is key. That's like the most, probably the most important thing in that music. Because it doesn't, you know, like like now, it doesn't matter how good someone is if they're not out there, you know, putting their stuff out there or putting themselves out there to uh, get their music heard. Because, you know, Love they can it, have man. a computer full, they can have a computer full of, you know, straight fire, but nobody, you know, nobody knows it. Yeah, Curtis King did something on Instagram yesterday where he was talking about, I, I don't know if you know him, but he's a really big oh, yeah, kind of yeah, like Instagram him. dude. And I like his message. It's really positive. But yeah, I think yesterday, like, stop waiting for perfection. Put it out. Mm -hmm. You know, put it out. Get some feedback. And you might you might be, might be scared of that, but, you know, you'll get feedback. And if you release 10 songs, you're going to hear from people that they like these ones better than these ones. And it'll give you some sense of, of what's working for you too. See, and that's what I love about YouTube. I'm, I'm, I'm all over like uh, Curtis King and Cow Beats and mm. uh, Pat Ryan. Let's see, uh, Simon Servita. He's another one that's blowing up. He's really good. Really good. Uh, and just all that because they, they, they're giving you knowledge, not just putting their beats on, you know, YouTube and stuff. They're trying to help you, you know, expand. You know uh, what? It's a, it's a fair it's an attractive way people people are interested in in value They're like if they can learn something you've got you've got to either be informative or entertaining mm -hmm. if if you want people to listen to you i'm not especially funny i'm not a comedian i'm not that entertaining so i try and share some some information with people and uh i, I feel it just makes me feel good if i can do that and if business comes my way because of it that's wonderful but if it doesn't I, i'm not transactional about it
tell us a little about yourself. I, uh, I knew that I wanted to do music from an early age, but I didn't really know what that looked like. I started out as a drummer and I, I, I toured and uh, I did really well at that. But I did realize at a certain point that I wasn't as good as the really amazing people. Like I- You're saying as a drummer, you weren't as good? Yeah, but I, but I understood how music worked and I understood the impact that music could have on people. And I understood what made music feel good and what made it feel cool or hip or whatever word you want to do. My superpower creatively was knowing when it was cool and when it wasn't. And so I, I discovered, oh, I almost spilled my coffee. I discovered songwriting and producing as a way to sort of formulate that stuff when I was sort of in my early twenties. And that for me was a good recipe because I loved playing drums and I loved the way that I could craft a beat to make people feel a certain way. But I also knew that I wasn't like the best of the best. Cause I would go see other amazing drummers and be like, Oh man, I'm just not that like they're too good. But I understood that I could, contribute if I was in a room and so I, I worked really hard on that and uh, I would I would program beats and when other drummers were trying to get good at drumming I was trying to get good at programming drum machines and that's what led me to to computers and and trying to build my craft around around the studio and and by the time I was 30 I was making records for for record labels and and big producers and I had a a tremendous run. Uh, things have changed a little bit like the record industry. And that's not to say that there, there isn't big records being made, but a lot of them are grown out of an independent kind of a situation. Mm. And my business has changed a lot. I work with a lot of independent artists. Um, I'm, I try to be as accessible as I can be. And I, I try and guide people when it makes sense. And I try and contribute to the records. And I still love to work on big projects, uh, but I, I find that my world is just way more all over the place. And, and people can reach out in a way that they couldn't before. Like artists, we didn't all have Instagram and, and Facebook and, and YouTube a few years ago, not that long ago. But now an artist can reach out to me and say, hey, can you answer this question? And if I can, I will. And if they want me to work on their project. We can negotiate and talk about that and see if it makes sense. So that's that's the, the, the short version of, of my journey. And, uh, and now I mix, there's an artist that I worked with for 10 years and uh, I mixed all his records and produced his records. And he does a mental health presentation, which is like a rock concert, but with storytelling in it. Mm -hmm. And his project has grown so big that he's playing like performing art centers and arenas. And he said, do you want to come mix the shows? Because you mix the records. Can you make it sound like that in an arena? And I said, that sounds pretty scary. I don't know. And, uh, and I said, let's give it a try. And so I started doing that a couple years ago. And the live sound thing just really triggered something for me. And so I've been doing half studio, half live stuff, obviously not during COVID. But mm -hmm. a lot of my focus is on live sound now. And I just find it really exciting and this particular artist is uh very exciting to work with and so uh, that's that's where i'm at in my career now how long have you been in the music industry i i have been i i, I, I toured and played as a young musician for 10 years and you know like played clubs and sort of climbed up into international touring uh, that turned into uh, uh, a record deal and a publishing deal out of Los Angeles when I was uh, so about 20 years ago. And then I produced only uh, as part of a team for mm -hmm. 10 years. And then I have a partner and we broke off and have done another 10 years. So 30 years altogether, I've been doing it, but 20 years I've been like in recording studios. 
So what, like, what do you, what do you recommend for people to get in touch with like labels and stuff? Cause I, even now I'm, you know, I just want to know where even some actual real studios are. A lot of times I'll go on Google or something and look for a studios near me or something like that. And it might just be somebody's house, you know, nowadays, I know a lot of nowadays, a lot of stuff you can do from home, but you know, how do you know, how do you think people can find actual studios that they can, you know, internship for or something like that? I think the I think the intern thing is much harder than it was because recording studios have trouble making money now. It, it, the case used to be that a, a band would come in and and lock out a studio. So, you know, in the eighties, nineties, early two thousands, a band would come in, they would lock out the studio. The studio fee is like say twenty five hundred dollars a day. Mm. They're going to stay for two months, three months, maybe. So studios were doing great and they could afford to have a whole hierarchy of people. That's not really the case now. Some of the three of the most beautiful studios in the world are in Vancouver. And that's a product of, of those eighties records. Uh, Brian Adams has a huge studio here. Uh, Bruce Fairburn, rest in peace is now gone, but he, he had a beautiful studio here. And, uh, and uh, there was a place called Little Mountain, which is still functioning under a new name uh, they just don't have the staff that they used to. So the way that most people are functioning is they use those recording studios to record. Then they go into a space like like mine. Most producers have their own space, which we call you know project studios. And I don't, I can't really justify having an intern in my space just because the economics of of how it works now. Mm -hmm. So I, but on the positive side, there are a lot of people with good. YouTube channels and like p me personally, uh, as I mentioned, I'm getting into live sound. I reached out to like two of the very, very top guys in the industry. Mm -hmm. I just cold called them and like kind of scary, like, okay, would you spend some time with me? But I offered to pay them. Uh -huh. So, you know, like one thing that, that you do find people are way more receptive if like it's a respect thing. Hey, I will pay you for an hour of your time. Because a lot of people reach out to me and they want free advice and I'll, I'll give people free advice if it's short, but my recommendation is like, you've got to show people that you value them. Uh -huh. And now I have a relationship with two of the top live engineers in the world. We meet on a regular basis and I can pick up the phone and ask them a question and, and it's really easy. So getting back to what you said about mentorship, I think is a great way. I think if you, I, I think the internet provides access to people who are doing the kinds of things that you would want to be doing. Uh -huh. And so I think maybe it's more about finding a, a mentor than it is a recording studio. Recording studios really need business. And it's always been this way. People who bring them business are the people who tend to find themselves in those spaces. Mm -hmm. So if you are a guy that is like a young up and coming producer engineer and you've got acts that have a budget taking them to a recording studio mm. is a great way to get into that world you're going to give up some of the budget but it, it kind of works for everybody if you're not able to get a good a good thing at home it's the phone started ringing it's all good so so there's that but you know I, a part of why I do YouTube is I just don't know that that's economically feasible for people in the come up. So I think that that you can start with not much and get something pretty good done. If you want to go to the point where you're releasing stuff on Spotify and you want your record to come behind like a commercial act mm -hmm. and not sound like garbage, I think that's doable in a project studio situation, but I, I advise people to try and build teams. And you know, the, the old saying is you never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. Like try and try and reach out to people who might be a level ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, people like me who have got, a, a, who have been in the business for a while, I still appreciate creativity more than anything like I have a lot of 
like ability to pull things together because I have done that for a long time. But a young person can get into the right rooms if they if they present a winning idea. That doesn't mean you have to be able to make it sound like a record all by yourself, mm -hmm. but like creativity wins, man. See, I'm 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 still new to like uh analog stuff but i mostly just got it when i got into it i got i learned uh plugins and all that stuff so i'm mostly digital that's what made me want to get into an actual studio to learn some analog stuff but i know uh pretty much a lot of the stuff you can do now just all through your laptop with all these plugins you know i think if you like it's like say you're a singer or a rapper mm -hmm. if you get a, a good microphone and i really don't mean a 69 dollar microphone i mean like a like a four or five hundred dollar microphone and a and a decent interface like a like like an apollo or or a focus right scarlet and i'm not saying that that's what rihanna is using but mm -hmm. but you can get something credible and then you can work your way up from there and if you can get into the world where you've got you know like a nice microphone and a nice preamp i think that you can generate so many good things in your laptop. Mm -hmm. And look, man, kids, I say kids, I mean, you know, people who are in their twenties are making fantastic records in laptops. And I mean, Billie Eilish's records are, the recording process is done, was done in a bedroom. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that those are the best sounding vocals ever recorded. Like she's using the, uh, $200 Audio Technica mic, but they made it on the radio. But what they needed was someone to come afterwards and help with the sonics and getting it as, as good as it could be. But I really think that you can do a lot. So to your point of, of learning analog gear, uh, focus on one thing. And, and I do think that, I think that good recordings live and die on a vocal sound. If you can get a record quality vocal sound i think you can make like cool beats and laptops that mm -hmm. sound fantastic and then you know get into a space where someone who's a little bit ahead of you can mix it for you uh, you know like i learned a lot of things by being in the right rooms i i hired mix engineers when i didn't know how to mix and and I and I watched them. I remember distinctly walking into the room. There's this guy, and he'd won a couple of Grammys. And I went in, I, and I loved his confidence. You know, I, I walked into the room. He's mixing a thing. I said, "Man," I said, "Do you think that's a little bit boomy?" He said, turned around, and looked at me like, "No," and he kept working. <laughs> and it's like, it like no. okay, lesson learned, you know. And and so, you know, sometimes you're paying people. For the product but take advantage of the situation and try and get into the room mm -hmm. where that's happening and i know that's difficult in covid but like right now this is the room mm -hmm. so like people want to share their expertise like if you do something cool and somebody asks you man that's cool how did you do that you want to tell them because you feel good about what you did people mm -hmm. will tell you and so you know sometimes it's worth paying somebody just for the education, you know, you can learn so much from people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's why I want to do these for just so people can, you know, learn as much as they can about every little thing, you know, just hearing from different people's perspective and, you know, life in general before, uh, like, I just want to learn from uh, Quincy Jones, because I like one of my top records is, you know, uh, Michael, you know, Michael Jackson songs. It's just the quality, not even just Michael Jackson, but like if you listen to the kicks and the snares, just the quality is, is something different. I don't know what they use. It's, it's crazy. I, I think at the time that those records were made, everybody on the team, and again, it's a team, Bruce Swedeen engineered those records. And it's, it's just a case of like uh, the talent recognized each other. And, and Quincy said, this guy records incredible sounds. And, 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 and Bruce said, man, this guy produces incredible records. And Michael Jackson said, that guy has got the sound of now. And Quincy said, this guy is just monstrous, monstrously talented. Like Quincy by that time could 
could do whatever he wanted to. And he was like, I want to make that guy's record. You know, and you, you get this perfect storm of people who are just like at the right place in their careers and on top of their game. And, and I think that that time really was the pinnacle of studio craft. Because if you listen to those records, the tools that they had to work with, like they were wonderful tools, but they don't have, they don't have anything like what we have now. And people will say, well, you know, it was better than because it was all analog. I think we have the best of both worlds now because mm -hmm. we can do stuff in a laptop, a thousand dollar laptop that you couldn't do in any recording studio for any amount of money when they made those records. Mm -hmm. so that's a good and a bad thing. But like the craft of how they recorded those things and how they decided. And I think it was uh, Quincy tells a story of, of Billie Jean. I think it was Billie Jean. It doesn't really matter which song it was. It might have been Beat It. But how they kept on refining the mix. Mm -hmm. And I think they were like on their 50th revision. And then they went back and said, play me the second revision of the song. And they were like, that's the record. We Like, like they did all these changes, but they like, you know, how it originally sound. We ruined it. We took the life out of it by by doing all this stuff. But... That's the, that's the talent of, of, of recognition. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that this is a, something that, that people should focus on. And I have to remind myself all the time. It's like when I'm working on a mix, close my eyes and listen to music instead mm -hmm. of look at the screen and look at the automation and look at the plugins and, and look at a knob and decide by looking at the knob, is that the right setting? And, Nobody's looking at the knob when they're listening to the song in their headphones on Spotify. Mm -hmm. That's what I like to do too, or just like, you know, have the fresh airs by coming back to a song the next day or something like that, you know, just to be like, oh, dang, what was I thinking then? You know, something like that. That is a good rule. So I have a little rule myself where, like, I like to work at nighttime, not super late, but I like to come down after dinner. My studio's like my project studio is at my house. So I can come down and work for a couple hours and, and the phone's not ringing anymore. I'm not getting emails anymore. And it's just kind of like my own space, my own time. I never send out anything I finish at nighttime because the end of the day and I'm tired. And I promise you, if I come down in the morning and listen to what I'm doing, some part of that's going to be like, oh, I need to address that before I send that out. See, I'm a nighttime person. I'd, I'd rather, you know, work at night and then, you know, listen in the morning, something like that. That's what I'm saying. Listen in the morning and then d decide if decide if it's right be when you're fresh. And the fresh listen mm -hmm. is valuable. Like uh, Greg Wells, who's a famous producer, says that the most important 10 minutes of his day are the first 10 minutes when he listens to his work in the morning. Because that's when he's reacting to things. Mm -hmm without knowing exactly what's coming and and I try and do that too like when I go have lunch I try and I, like I don't listen to what I'm like an mp3 of what I'm working on I try and get away from it and come back mm -hmm. and I learned this from Bob Powers who's a famous mix engineer like mm -hmm. take a break and then come back and listen with a piece of paper and listen to the whole three and a half, four minutes, whatever it is, and make notes. Because you only have the fresh listen opportunity for that three and a half minutes. As soon as you hear something and dive in and start working on it, your mm -hmm. fresh loosen, fresh listen thing is all gone. So like turn up the hi-hat a little bit. Is the vocal too loud in the second verse? Like this, mm -hmm. these kind of notes, just like as it's passing by, write that stuff down. And at the end of it, you'll have 20 notes and I promise you, like 19 of them wouldn't have happened if you dived in and started fixing the first one. And another, another one of my problems is, um, but I'm, I'm relatively newer, like I got back into music, to be honest, about like four or five years ago. So, uh, you know, as opposed to people that have been in 20 plus years, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but another one of my problems is the getting the volume right for just exporting, you know, I don't, a lot of times my music's too loud, so I'm not sure what's going on. You know, I'll turn it down, but I don't want it to be, to be too low. I'm not sure what's the right thing to get the good, you know, the radio ready volume. Is it just comparing tracks or? 
No, it's it's measuring. So th there's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, I know there's a pile of plugins, but I so I, I do two things. I want if I'm playing a mix for a client and I know it's going to go to mastering, then I put some limiting on it so that it when they compare it to other songs, it's mine isn't quiet. And then, you know, like the one that you're listening to from a commercial artist isn't way louder. People will naturally like anything that's louder. It's just a part of how our brain works and recognizing that that's a reality is really important. When you're working on a mix or a thing, whatever one is louder, you'll like better. The, the quieter one might be a better sound, but you'll like the louder one. So I try and limit things a little bit. The, the streaming level is how we measure now is something called LUFS, loudness units. Uh -huh. I use isotope ozone to measure that and to, and it will add minus 14 LUFS is like the Spotify standard volume. So uh -huh. if you print something at that volume and someone's like comparing it to things on Spotify, they'll be about even. And so that's considered like a good place to be. So I use ozone uh, waves as a measurement. It's called WLM. Mm -hmm. Those are the two that I use. I'm not saying those are not like, the best choices. I but, like the ozone. I have uh, ozone's elements. The, yeah, and, and that will do it for you. And I don't think the elements one is tremendously expensive. Mm -hmm. So minus 14. But I do want to I do want to hit the limiter a little bit, but I don't really want to hear it. And so I will print two versions of a mix. I will print one that I'm going to play for my client, and then I print another one that doesn't have limiting on it. And I will give both of those to the mastering engineer if it's going to mastering. And if you've never sent anything to a mastering engineer, I would really recommend that you try that. Because yeah, it's it's going to be an extra little bit of money, and the price can range from a hundred to two hundred twenty-five, two fifty for like a quality job. But it, even if you're not going to release something, I think you should be releasing stuff. I'd encourage you to spend the money for the educational value, because mm -hmm. what comes back at you is going to be like an enhanced version of what you did, mm -hmm. and it's going to be like it's going to maybe motivate you as to what the possibilities are because mm -hmm. a good mastering engineer can't fix your mix, but he can make, he or she can make whatever that is and make it like an Uber version of, of what you created. So minus 14 is a good place to start. And I do want to hit the limiter a little bit. And I don't know, I use isotope advanced. I don't know what elements has in it, but mm -hmm. um, you can, you can have it set minus 14 lefts and it will move the threshold around by mm -hmm. itself in advance. I don't know if Elements does that. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I, where you, it has like an assistant or something where you push the yeah. assistant and it starts to adjust it for you. Yeah, it's got that. It's got that. I know it's just missing a lot of the manual stuff to that uh, advance has, but it's still like a, a good thing. And I actually got it for super cheap. Uh, you, you heard of Plugin Boutique? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I buy so much stuff from there. That's where that's where everything's at. <laughs> yeah, I, I buy stuff from there too. Um, they did have they had a good deal a little while ago, right? It was like sixty bucks or something like that for yeah, elements it, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's what I, I I forgot how much I paid, but it came with like the like a whole suite of stuff. So I'm still right. gonna do that. So those those things. And and the elements is good. Like I, I have, uh, like the RX elements because i don't i don't need like the big package i wouldn't mind having it but i don't it's like i don't know six or eight hundred bucks or something like that mm -hmm. but one of the things that i do is i have to denoise and de-click files that i get especially project studio files and that's got all the stuff in there and and i didn't pay that much for it and it's like the tool is just as good as like the expensive version it's just like the the number of tools are smaller, but it has a couple of the right ones for me. So yeah, good, good choice. I like isotope products very much and they're not paying me to say that. Oh I yeah, no, they, I, I wish I, they were. I, I always tell people about isotope or um, like Arturia, anything from Arturia is good. Yeah. I like all the plugins. And uh, 
what what um so as a guy who's sort of on this journey and you're a little bit in a different place and what I am what where do you spend your money like like are you are you focused on mixing or are you focused on creating beats or or I, I like what are you sounds. focused on I like sounds so I'm you know constantly on like I said plug in boutique to have as many sounds as I can and just you know that's my main thing I like going through sounds hearing finding new sounds um like even native instruments I have mm -hmm. that I got those and I keep getting those on sale when they're like you know crazy low so I've got the ultimate so that so I'm still going to I'm going through sounds forever but um I'm I also try and go through plugins to help me like like I said mix this to find good or um to make the beat as good as it can sound like make the sound come out as crisp as and clear as it can. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I was learning about mixing that it's, you know, that's as important as the song itself, no matter how good the song is, if the mix is off, it, it might not sound right. So. Um, the, the, the sonics of it and the vibe of it are kind of like the sex appeal part of the equation mm -hmm. and the the lyrics in the story are kind of like the personality part of the equation mm -hmm. and uh, you know when you're if you look at it as like a relationship kind of thing you don't you don't probably get to know the personality unless the sex appeal and the vibe is attractive mm -hmm. uh, you know that's kind of how how it works right like if if it doesn't interest you it doesn't sort of like turn that little light bulb on to go, oh, what is that? You know, then you might not get to the layer of, oh, wow, that person's saying something really interesting. And, and I'm not saying that a song has to necessarily be deep to be a good song, mm -hmm. like, like uh, a relationship song or, or a story. Um, we all have different moods and, and different times. I mean, past the Corvassier can be just as inclusive and interesting to listen to at the right time as, you know, a song about, um, about love or, or sex or passing away or whatever. You know, we have, those of us who love music, at least for me, like I lean on all those things mm -hmm. for emotional support in some ways, you know? And I just love getting into that, but the, the mood of the the sonics has to match the the content of the song and that goes back to closing your eyes and and asking like i i feel like in you know in a pop world and by pop i mean like rap and and pop and urban music i think that sometimes we're so focused on making it aggressive mm -hmm that we lose sight that not every song is presenting that vibe or that mood. And I think it's good. I had a mentor in the publishing industry who said to me, sum up the song with like, choose one emotion mm -hmm. and decide what it is. Is this song sad is it exuberant is it enthusiastic is it happy and that can, that can stretch beyond sad angry happy but he mm -hmm. said decide on a word and then ask yourself if everything is pointing towards that and it helps you do a bit of an alignment check mm -hmm. as to because nobody wants to hear i really really love you you know like that mm -hmm. that makes no sense mm -hmm. so you know I'm just passing on what was a helpful, a helpful tip to me. Yeah, I just watched a, um, an Ed Sheeran documentary. That was pretty good. He he was uh, like how we were talking about renting out studios. He he rented out a cabin or something for like his whole album when it, when uh, you know where everybody met in the cabin and then they made the whole album there and it showed his writing process and different things like that. And he was going through the same kind of stuff you're talking about, just what's what's the mood of the song. And, you know, um, while they were coming up with lyrics, playing the different guitars, um, guitars and all that kind of stuff until the final product came out, you know? 
Yeah, I, I mean, he he gets knocked a little bit, but I think he makes great records, man. Hmm. Um, what else did I have for you? Um, what advice do you have on giving on getting collaborators, like, uh, or just finding new artists or getting your work out there as a engineer or just as a producer? Uh, okay, well, let's start with getting your work out there as a producer. It, it goes back to releasing material. I, oddly, I mean, this sounds like a, like a strange thing to stipulate, but I stipulate very strongly that if I'm going to work with somebody, that they, they need to release it. Like, I don't want to make, even if you're going to pay me, Mm -hmm. I don't want to make stuff for your hard drive. Just for it to just sit there, right? Yeah. I, I, and and so many people, either because it's fear or um, or this doesn't, like I get that you get down to a certain place in a song and it doesn't fit with what you're doing. But, you know, that that's fair enough. But if, if we've mixed it, you should know by now, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so... So do that, uh, share with people, uh, reaching out to people who are in your world is a good thing to do. Um, it's easy to send somebody a DM mm -hmm. on Instagram and you, you know, this suits different personality types better than others, but mm -hmm. sometimes I reach out to people and they have a pile of followers and I reach out and, and just say something nice about what they're doing and they don't answer me. Mm -hmm. and you know what that's cool that's fine they didn't see it they don't care to answer they're busy there could be a million reasons don't take it personally you know reach out even if one in ten people answer mm -hmm. you know who knows uh i encourage people like the, the internet makes it possible like you and me we we met through instagram we are we're, we're not a drive apart, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, right. It would take me like three days to drive to where you are. So that's cool. And we can create this kind of community, uh -huh. but I do think it's kind of cool if you can try and get into your local community uh -huh. where you can share some of the resources you were talking about. How do you find recording studios? Uh -huh. uh, like if I met you, like if I was coming to, to near Flint to record something, uh -huh. I would call you and ask you where's a good studio. I wouldn't like go on Google if I had an option and uh -huh. start looking at recording studios. I'd see what you have to say and then I'd go go look. So your your like local network can help you find people who are in your neck of the woods who can help uh, with any of the pieces that you don't have. Being self-aware is good. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a good lyricist or I'm a good rapper or that's what I bring to the table so yeah. I want to work with someone who does good beats or I I make good beats so I I need a rapper like like understanding what it is that you're good at and you might do lots of things but lead with your strength yeah and then find the pieces that that you don't have and uh put yourself out there man like release stuff releasing stuff isn't free but it's pretty close to free mm -hmm. and then share that with people and you know another another good thing to do is offer people something with no strings attached like mm -hmm. if you hear somebody rapping that you think is really cool or singing that you think is really cool and you make beats say hey i think what you're doing is really really cool i made this beat i think it'd be really good for you you mm -hmm. don't have to buy it for me if you use it I'll share, I'll share with you, whatever it is. Can mm -hmm. I send it to you? And that's it. And maybe something happens, maybe something does it, but reaching out to people and it's not like, and if you use it, you need to pay me. Mm -hmm. Like go, go in with, with let's collaborate, but don't go in with, Hey, I want to collaborate empty space after it. Hey, I want to collaborate. Here's an idea. Yeah. That's, that's what I tell people too. Like I, you know, it's not only about saying, hey, I'm going to charge you for 50 bucks for my beat or something like that. 
it's better to say, hey, let's work together. You know, since I'm making the beat, you're singing on it, we can just do 50-50. I put as much as I can into marketing it and you put in, you know, you market it as well. And then we can go from there. You, we both make money as opposed to just you, you know, one person thinking they're, you know, above the other person, even if they are maybe, you know, but at least if, if, like if I gave the person the fifty dollars and that was it, you know, they they went on my song. Who knows what how much I would make, and then they'll feel cheated, as opposed to if it's like a fifty fifty thing, you know. Yeah, and and I think it at a level where that we're talking about where you're you're, you're sort of coming up and you're you're putting songs on uh, whatever you use in Spotify or Apple Music, and I guess you're using all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal is not to make money. Mm -hmm. The goal is to get heard mm -hmm. by people, not by industry people. I mean, it's cool if industry people hear it, but like these stories that a label's going to hear it and sweep you off your feet and it's like winning the lottery mm -hmm. are not really realistic. Like labels jump onto things that it, like where a train is already running. That people hear. It's better for people to hear it. That way, if, if enough people hear it, the labels will hear it. People have to actually like it for you to be successful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, put stuff out there, refine it. You know, um, there's so many cool stories of people, of independent artists, like jumping up with the help of a label. But what people need to realize is that, is that like they broke through and they were gonna break through anyway because the music was really cool and people were responding to it. And label pretty much found them and you know trying to get trying to get it up on them more than the other way around, you know. Yeah, uh, labels don't do artist development. So, hey, SoundCloud is a cool community. I'm not really in that world myself, but I know a few folks who are doing really well with that thing and that can be a good a good place to start like there's really good communities and it's a good place to to find like your um your community uh-huh yeah at least it, it seems like that to me and, and i won't try and pretend i know much about that but i know people who've done really well especially in dance music and urban music um what do you, what do you think about like what's a good way to, for people to improve their music, um, just improve in general, just from YouTube tutorials or like what's the best way to actually improve? Repetition, repetition, set a time. Everybody who's good at anything mm -hmm. has a schedule. If, if, if you're gonna be an Olympic swimmer, you swim every morning at seven o'clock. If you're gonna write songs, you write songs every day. Everybody that I know that's good at this does it and and you might have a job you know so you can't just do it all day every day but do you have the discipline to do it for 30 minutes a day because that's that's how you're gonna do it if you do it every day then even if it's a small amount of time because you're tired and then do it on the weekends like waiting for inspiration to hit is sorry man it's bullshit It'll never happen. Yeah. It's never going to happen. So decide and, and do it like at a time and get your ass off the couch and, and, and say, okay, is it at 7 p.m. every night I'm going to write or do beats or mix or whatever it is, I'm going to do it for even if it's 20 minutes because 20 minutes will turn into 30 minutes a month down the road and then as you get better at it, your your ability to focus and do it more um, becomes greater. And if you're not willing to do that, mm -hmm. it's not for you. Yeah, you don't love it. Yeah. You actually do it every day. Exactly. So schedule. Everybody, everybody who is good at anything. So you don't see the fact that that, you know, like when you go watch an athlete, you don't see the part where they were in the gym every morning. You just see them hitting those three pointers. Mm -hmm. But 
that didn't that didn't happen by playing basketball games. That happened with the five hours of practice every day before the basketball game. And that's another thing I tell people about uh, uh, practicing the actual programs, the DAWs that themselves, rather than um, just repetition or uh, not just repetition, but just going through the same things you already know, as opposed to learning the different DAWs and saying, hey, um, I learned this new trick. It's going to help me advance. Um, I, I think that's good advice, man. Like people do the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Like listen to a record and go, I wonder how they did that. Mm -hmm. And then, and then try and figure it out. Um, I, I do that all the time because I have to, because you know, like people will send me something to work on and say, Hey, did you hear what they did on that record? Could you do that? And I have to go, Hmm. I wonder my, the answer can never be no. Mm -hmm. The answer has to be yes. That's why they're hiring me. And maybe I know how to do it, but maybe I have to figure out how to do it. And sometimes it's like, man, I don't know how they did that. And I might not end up doing it the same way as somebody else did it. But figuring it out is kind of like a part of the fun. And now that tool is, is in my toolbox for next time. And just perfecting your craft. Like I'm trying to learn, learn how to read music right now. So I've been practicing on the keyboard um, but before I was just making beats kind of just by ear or, you know, um, like, hey, I think this is where the, this is this kick snare combination sounds good or um, the hi-hats sound, you know, sound good if I do it like this. And, you know, maybe using different MIDI patterns for the keyboards as opposed to actually playing it out. You know, I can say, hey, uh, once I get better at reading all this music and playing, actually playing classical or something you know it'll make my beats even you know even that much better you know? absolutely and, and you know here's another one and and people people will push back against this find a beat you really like mm -hmm. and copy it exactly copy mm -hmm. it not because you're going to use it and try and sell it as something else because mm -hmm. you're going to have to figure some stuff out if you want it like listen to that song and listen to your version of copying can you make it sound like the record you're yeah. going to have to figure some stuff out in order to do that when i was um in my 20s the the drummer and the bass player for prince put out a loop cd cd <laughs> and and so the idea was like you could like build a song over top of their grooves i sat in my hotel room, I was on tour and mm -hmm. I recreated every beat on that CD. And I never used any of them for songs, uh -huh. but, but I learned a lot about how somebody else was putting things together. Just to see how, see if you could do it or not. And it built my, like my musical rhythmic vocabulary because they're doing things that, that I wasn't necessarily doing. And then all of a sudden my like, vocabulary for doing things became much bigger and like it forces you to go okay what what do these sounds actually sound like mm -hmm. it's kind of like singing like i i, I kind of have a beef with singers because singers never practice singers just sing uh -huh. and they don't get better in the same way that like people who play keyboards or guitar or bass because you have to practice in order to get good enough to like play a song but mm -hmm. singers just sing along it's pretty natural but once singers get into the art of singing and start investigating that that's when they start to get good and like there's all this footage of ariana grande like doing impressions of other singers when she was younger sounding like britney sounding like christina aguilera that was her exploring her voice and what other singers are doing, learning those riffs. What does Mariah Carey do? And then actually perfecting that lick. So people think, well, what's the point of sounding exactly like Mariah Carey? Well, she doesn't, she can do it, but she has like all of those little things available to her. Like if I wanna do something that sounds like that, I know how to do it because I already formulated that. Because you practice it already and you kind of know Exactly. What you're capable of. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. To build skills. 
I think that's I think that's everything. Well, that's about an hour, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you stopping by. Any little bit helps. I'm trying to, you know, learn as much as I can and speed other people's processes up and just learning from you, you know, helps well, a lot. We all are, man, and uh I am still trying to learn every day and I think that that's a part of what can make this kind of a career really interesting. You know, you're never if you still have the hunger to, to get better at it, I think there's always room to grow. So, and keep doing your YouTube, uh, pretty much how you're doing it, because it's it's like great quality. Where I can see you reaching a million, you know, in no time. Just, thanks, man. Thanks, man. Like well, the quality, the like the fact you're actually talking into the camera, like like if the person's actually there, um, the screen sharing, so we can actually see exactly what you're doing. The audio, where it's coming out crystal clear the quality the video quality all that well, like thank you man i appreciate that that makes me feel good i i appreciate that and uh you know i hope i can help some people out and and that's my that's my reward is it just makes me feel good to do it so so thank you and if you could keep doing the um like the beat breakdowns you did with the um, it was re one of the later the latest videos that you posted where he was breaking down like the bass and the drums that you know in the order he was doing them it's like beat breakdowns. Those okay. Videos, those, those videos would be good. Okay. Well, thanks, man. I'm always, I'm always interested in what people want to talk about and hear. So for anybody watching this, jump on my YouTube channel or my Instagram and, and ask me a question. Cause like, sometimes I'm, you know, like I want to make videos that aren't boring. So mm -hmm. if you've got a question, I, I want to, I want to answer it because I think that just makes it more interesting for everybody. Well, thanks again. Okay, man. All right. Have a good, good one. Good talk to you.